So my name is Jonathan Snook. Um, I'm a web developer. Um, I've built desktop applications, websites, um, web apps. Uh, and uh, a lot of what I've been kind of doing these days is um, uh, also playing on mobile. Um, at, at least um, uh, iPhone and Android. Um, I work at Yahoo, so we've been doing a lot of work in trying to create a consistent experience um, across all platforms. Um, so the session title was Rocking iPhone and Android Development. Um, I've kind of put a context to this, which is narrowing the context, um, and we'll kind of see why when we get into it. So what I won't be talking about, um, I thought that might be important to kind of cover right off the bat, because uh, with a title like iPhone and Android development, I think most people might expect uh, native application development, uh, such as uh, learning Objective-C uh, or Java, and uh, I will not be talking about that. So what will I be talking about? Uh, hey, I've got this little controller here, why don't I do that? Um, so I'm going to be talking about HTML development for mobile platforms um, uh, because I think that's um, an important thing. We've got this ability to create an experience, not necessarily a consistent experience, uh, but an experience nonetheless um, and be able to deploy uh, our sites and applications across uh, multiple devices, uh, both mobile and desktop. And I think that's really important. So. When we look at iPhone and Android development specifically, um, generally we're talking about mobile Safari development. Uh, so mobile Safari is a WebKit-based browser. Um, a lot of the uh, new smartphones have been uh, going the WebKit route. Um, Samsung apparently has a new phone out that's uh, WebKit-based. Uh, Palm, which is now HP since they bought them out, uh, uh, their entire, entire platform for the phone is WebKit-based. and. It, it, in some ways, it's kind of nice when you think, oh, geez, everybody's using WebKit. We now have this potential to only have to deal with one specific browser. Um, long gone are the days that we have to worry about Internet Explorer and Firefox and Opera and all these different platforms. Um, and yet, oddly enough, um, a gentleman by the name of PPK, uh, Peter Polcock out of uh, the Netherlands, has actually done a fair amount of mobile research, including taking a look at the different Safari versions. Uh, and it turns out there is actually a lot of difference uh, between a lot of these platforms. So it's still not quite the uh, um, utopia that we hope for, uh, but it's still pretty darn good. So what kind of stuff does uh, mobile Safari offer us? Uh, local storage uh, is important. Uh, traditionally, when we thought about local storage, uh, usually we looked at cookies uh, being the most predominant way. Uh, but cookies often was very limited. With uh, local storage, we can actually store up to five megs uh, of information on the phone, on the iPad, um, which hopefully is enough for your needs. Otherwise, we have to start looking at pushing information uh, back out onto the internet or looking at uh, native application development. We've got a lot of CSS3 features, uh, which um, I'm going to show off some demos, which I hope are pretty cool. And uh, so we got things like transforms, you know, where we can take an object and we can rotate it, um, uh, we can flip it. Uh, you know, Apple's done a lot of really nice work in, in this regards to really create these application-like interfaces um, that we can do actually with CSS stuff that we um, can see on the iPhone. We can also see on the desktop, which is really nice. Uh, and then transitions and animations as well. So we can uh, save ourselves the, the work of actually having to use <coughs> JavaScript to do the heavy lifting. Uh, and in some cases, uh, the phones are actually optimized for certain cases uh, where we're doing animations, which is fantastic. So we have geolocation as well, um, which is uh, obviously one of our hot topics these days, you know, to a lot of location-based services that we can actually uh, take advantage of that. Uh, to give you an example um, for a hobby, for fun, um, I built a, a little application which tied to geolocation and then used that geolocation to give you the weather data. So wherever you were, um, it would tell you where you happened to, what the weather was like, if it was sunny out. Uh, of course, you'd probably just step outside and find out if it was sunny. But, uh, but again, the, the ability to be able to do this, not only on the mobile platform, but also to be able to do this on the desktop, desktop platform. The fact that we have the ability to uh, write once and run anywhere uh, is quite nice. Uh, we have things like HTML5 support, uh, and even just in really small, subtle ways, uh, which I think are important, um, such as um, unique uh, input types, uh, for those that are familiar with the old ones, like checkbox and text. Um, you know, that we have new ones like search and, and, and number 
that allow us to customize the experience um, in, in really subtle ways. And then we have things like SVG, which is a, a scalable vector format, uh, which is great on the iPhone. Um, unfortunately, Android doesn't support SVG yet for some bizarre reason. Um, and for those um, who long for the new iPhone 4, um, as I do, uh, because of the, the, the high resolution of these new displays, um, SVG actually is uh, a good candidate for doing a lot of web-based images where uh, you can have the single image and it will scale um, and still keep the file size down. Um, we had done some tests to see, you know, okay, we've got something on the iPhone 4 and then even as you zoom in, that you still have the crispness of all the lines uh, because of the, uh, the SVG as opposed to um, actually using uh, regular images like ping or JPEG. So some of the other features um, as far as how do we target um, these devices, uh, one is using style sheets. Here's the thing though, most style sheets, um, there is a, a type um, that we can normally target called handheld, but because of a lot of these smartphones, I think that they're as good as desktop browsers, in which a lot of cases they are, they actually ignore the handheld uh, type and use the screen type instead. So we have to target them in different ways. Uh, in this case, uh, for let's say the iPhone, uh, we can specify the actual device width. So it has so many pixels wide, um, and we can say, okay, well, because um, it is 480 pixels wide, for anything below that, give it specific style sheet, specific formatting uh, to really customize the experience for, for those uh, devices. We have the ability to customize the viewport uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, and this has to do with because of how um, browsing uh, on the iPhone and Android devices work where you have to zoom in and zoom out in order to be able to view the content. Um, it actually makes a distinction um, between uh, what the actual page width is and the actual um, uh, device width is. So we can, for example, in the first line, uh, specify that the width um, that it displays the page instead of trying to default um, to, for example, 960 pixels as it does on the iPhone uh, or the iPad, uh, we can specify that it should be the width of whatever the device is. Um, or we can give it a specific width uh, and maybe adjust the scaling. We can also specify whether or not we should um, be scaled at 100% or maybe we should be zoomed in or zoomed out by default. Generally speaking, most people uh, building these custom applications for mobile platforms are, you know, they don't want people to zoom in and out. They want it to look and behave like a native application. Uh, in which case, you generally set the initial scale to zero, or sorry, to one, um, and set the user scalable equal to no, which is uh, an option that's uh, in this last example. And this basically restricts people from uh, resizing it. It really kind of creates this, this native um, uh, design. So there's an, a couple other things uh, as well. Um, this is more specific to the iPhone um, than Android. But uh, you know, to create that app-like experience, you know, the fact is, is that we can have uh, a web page and we can save it to the home screen. And when we do that, there are certain properties uh, within the HTML page that we can use to specify when it gets saved to the home screen so that we can customize that. So I realized in this uh, uh, bunch of code examples, I kind of duplicated myself a little bit uh, in trying to cover everything. Um, the Apple Touch icon, for example, um, allows us to customize the actual icon that appears on the home screen. As a native application developer, we have a little bit more control. Um, the iPhone actually creates a little bit of a highlighting on the icons. Um, it'll do that automatically for um, any icon that you specify here, whereas native application developers can actually specify whether or not that highlight occurs or not. Uh, so that might be a consideration. You don't actually have to put your own highlights to your buttons. Um, the next one is the Apple Mobile uh, web app capable. And what this does is when we've saved it to the home screen and we actually um, open it from there, whether or not the address bar should appear. Does it appear like a browser or does it appear like a native application so you don't get any of the Chrome uh, available? Uh, the one thing that is always remaining is the, uh, the uh, status bar, you know, giving you the time, um, you know, whether or not you're connected. And uh, we can also customize the look of that. Instead of where it might normally be uh, metal, 
uh, we can actually specify that it should be black. So we can really customize that to our, our application. Unfortunately, there's only the two options. Um, uh, actually, I think there's a transparent one as well. So as you, uh, uh, if you were to scroll your application up, it would the title bar would, or the status bar would appear semi-transparent over top of your uh, application. Then the last one on the list is the Apple Touch startup image. So this is important, um, again, I think for creating a, an app-like experience, uh, but is one that I don't see people using a lot. Uh, and I think it's an important one from a user experience uh, perspective because there is often a delay uh, when you click on the icon and when the application actually loads. And so as a result of that, um, you want something that the user can see um, so they understand that their application is loading and it's not just sitting there. Uh, so using this will show that image and then once the page is actually uh, loaded, it will um, hide that and you can create whatever um, loading experience you want from there. So touching on the input features um, that I had mentioned before, uh, first one, autocorrect, um, on or off, so whether or not it should actually try to adjust your spelling. In some cases you may not want that. Uh, placeholder text, um, how many people here do JavaScript? Pretty good crab. How many of you remember like having a form with default text and saying, okay, well, on focus, uh, I need to replace the value and change it back and forth? Um, kind of a cumbersome process. And so we can actually specify a placeholder attribute and save us having to create any JavaScript for that. The placeholder text will be visible in the input box so that when we actually click in there, um, the text will disappear and allow us to actually enter any information. And then we've got a number of custom uh, fields, things like email, URL, uh, number, and search. Um, and what these allow us to do is a couple of things. On the iPhone, it actually creates custom <coughs> keyboards that we can use. Um, you know, obviously if we're entering an email address, uh, we're gonna wanna be able to use the at symbol and the dot. The space is probably gonna be less relevant. Uh, otherwise, you're always constantly shifting back to the second <coughs> screen to hit some of the buttons you want, to shift back to the first screen and to get everything that we want. Uh, likewise for typing in URLs, you know, .com is going to be uh, a fairly common one, although sometimes I wish they were localized. Um, you know, for, I'm from Canada, so it would be nice to have .ca there instead. Uh, you know, .co, .za would be nice as well. Uh, and then uh, the last example is numbers. Again, you know, to have to shift to um, the secondary screen in order to get access to the information that we want. Um, these are just really nice little helpers um, that give us uh, the ability to customize the experience uh, and make it a little bit more app-like. So this is uh, my demo portion of the, uh, of the day. So the iPhone, um, ConvertBot is an iPhone application. Um, and it's, it's a pretty neat little app that allows you to convert between units. Uh, however, it's a native iPhone application. Um, and uh, I would use my iPhone to demonstrate, but it's probably a little small, so I'm gonna use uh, my iPad. So, ConvertBot, pretty straightforward. And basically, you know, as we, uh, we can rotate, choose different things, um, and what this allows us to do is actually customize and you know, say, okay, I need to convert between two units. But this is a pretty, to me, a straightforward application that can actually be duplicated in HTML and CSS. So I, uh, in my spare time of what limited time I have, um, I've been working on a prototype, uh, which is actually just HTML and CSS and taking advantage of what I could um, with the browser. So um, thankfully, uh, the, the guys from ConvertBot were really nice. I emailed them and said, can I get the original graphics so I can at least make it look the same? And uh, they were nice enough to send them to me. And I was able to do things like, okay, so we have this tile in the middle, uh, but it needs to be a number of different places. Uh, normally, what you might think is, well, I'll just have a big image. Uh, but I was actually up, able to take this single tile and rotate it around uh, eight times. The different units around the circle are just HTML text which is great because I can then customize that experience for uh, not only maybe distances, uh, volume, all the different ones. I don't have to create multiple, uh, um, you know, multiple graphics in order to pull this off. 
I can just reuse um, the widgets that I have. And being able to do that, to be able to reuse um, a number of different sprites means that I can optimize the performance. That I'm not downloading a lot of images um, and a lot of stuff just to recreate this experience uh, from an HTML level. And then I can do things like having the slide down and slide up um, in order to be able to um, create that animation. That animation doesn't use JavaScript. That's just CSS. Um, it takes a touch event, so which is JavaScript, uh, but then just says, okay, well, attach a class to open up the panel. And then if I type, which in this case just gives me a little alert to indicate that I've actually pressed something, um, that I've got that functionality. And that is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, it also works on the Palm Pre. Um, and should work on the Android, um, but unfortunately, um, again, because the, the experiences between the phones are slightly different, um, it is a little bit more complicated to create cross-browser on cross-devices. So how do we test across multiple devices? Well, it would be great if we all had iPhones and Palms and uh, Android uh, phones. Um, I know I'd love to have a whole collection of cell phones at home. Uh, Thankfully, in most cases, um, they offer um, the um, SDKs. And so you can actually emulate these environments uh, on your desktop so that you can test. Um, they're usually not 100%, but at least you can create a, an experience that is fairly close. And uh, for a web-based application like this um, is a perfect uh, way to do that. So that for Android development, that we can load up the Android emulator and actually test everything uh, before deploying it out. A framework for creating these types of applications um, called Sencha Touch, um, which has been around for a while, uh, formerly as JQ Touch. Um, the developer for JQ Touch actually ended up getting hired from Sencha. Um, and it is designed for developing for the iPhone and Android applications, that they have not only the JavaScript for handling touch events, things like swipes, uh, pinches and zooms and all those different interactions uh, that, uh, you know, it allows you to build an application for these devices really fast. So I'm going to go into another quick demonstration. So um, how many people here are familiar with 100 push-ups, the concept? I did it. Hey, good job, Dustin. Um, <laughs> so 100 push-ups, for those who don't know, is basically uh, you start off on a weekly schedule, about three times a week, to uh, build up to the point where you could actually do 100 push-ups at once. But I thought, okay, you know, I want to build an application that lets me to track my progress. Um, and I want to be able to do this on my phone. If I happen to be traveling, I can do this in the hotel, and I can keep track of how well I'm doing. So I thought, well, I'm going to see if I can build an application to do this. Um, and this was using uh, JQ Touch, now Sentia Touch because I had all the stuff that I wanted to do. So if I wanted to, um, it's got the animations in between the stuff. So I say add, and then I can choose what part of the program am I on. And then when I add those results, it automatically adds it to the list. Now, there's a couple things in this. Um, one of the things is that I actually use local storage to store the information uh, on the device. So I can exit out, come back in, and my information will still be there. Uh, so I don't have to worry about setting up a server to host this anywhere. Um, I don't have to worry about any kind of user bandwidth. Um, the fact is, is that I can use things like cache manifests, which allow me to cache all the resources, all the images that would be required to actually create this um, locally on the phone. And as a result of that, um, I've got something that not only works on the iPhone, works on the iPad, works on the desktop, and so I have all these different devices um, that I can keep track of this information. I'm not creating a native application for one platform that nobody else can use. Um, you know, I have the ability to create it for all devices, um, and I did that in two hours. Um, all the storage, all the development, um, Thankfully, because of the platform, uh, you know, the, all the animations were there. All I basically had to say was, I've got two forms. I now need to create this animation between them. And the bulk of the work was just getting the local storage to work. Uh, one of the catches that I ran into was actually um, with local storage is a 
key value pair, um, but the value is always a string, uh, which wasn't necessarily practical for what I wanted to do. So what I wanted to do is take JSON data and serialize that into uh, a single string. But I was puzzled at the fact that the iPhone uh, doesn't have native JSON support. Um, at least it didn't in 3, um, 3.2. Um, iOS 4 might have it now. Um, whereas like the Palm Pre did um, and, and Android did. And so that mean, meant I had to throw in a, a JSON parser thanks to Douglas Crockford. And I had the information serialized and saved uh, on the device. So I think that uh, you know, it really does allow for rapid application development. The fact that I'm able to build uh, a simple application uh, in two hours and deploy that to multiple devices um, is really handy. Uh, you know, I can create a custom icon, uh, create a custom uh, startup image, and have access to all the information that I need. Um, and then for those of you that uh, saw the Q&A, um, the Free Mobile um, will be coming out soon. So I, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, seeing that. So some people may still be interested in going native. Um, I think one of the biggest hurdles that we have uh, with HTML-based applications has to do with money. Um, there is not an easy way right now uh, with mobile platforms to make money. Uh, the reason for that is, is just the, the, the process for purchasing applications uh, native applications is streamlined. It is super easy. Um, you can do it on the desktop. Uh, you can do it on the device. Press a button, click OK, and you've got an application. So in the meantime, what do we do as far as making money? Um, and we don't want to necessarily create our own payment gateways. Uh, we can actually try to create native applications, uh, but still using the, um, the HTML, CSS, um, and JavaScript-based knowledge that we have. But there's some other reasons why we might want to. Um, access to native hardware. Um, you know, there are a lot of function, functionality that we don't have um, on the native device, um, sorry, in the, the browser. We don't have access to the camera. Um, we don't have access to their address book. Um, you know, th there's no way to suck in information from the phone into our own device. Uh, so we really have to go with a native-based application in order to be able to pull that data in. And of course, the ability to streamline the revenue process. So there's um, two major um, platforms right now that have really taken off. Uh, one is PhoneGap, um, which, uh, hey, Canadian company from Vancouver, yay. Uh, and, uh, and Titanium, which is uh, based out of Mountain View. Um, and Titanium Mobile um, targets iPhone and Android only. And what they do is, is they actually take um, your code that happens to be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and actually creates native code from that. Um, it actually creates Objective-C um, to run on the devices um, or uh, Java in the case of Android. Whereas the PhoneGap, I think, is really trying to create more of a um, ubiquitous experience. The fact that you can deploy and that they're targeting things like BlackBerry and Symbian uh, above and beyond iPhone and Android is really nice. So what other um, experiences um, do we have to consider? So I've kind of talked a lot about the, um, these smartphones. Unfortunately, not everybody has uh, these really nice smartphones. Um, you know, for the longest time, I had this cheap little Nokia that you know, uh, wasn't uh, WML, but uh, was pretty darn close. Um, and so how do we, uh, how do we customize that, that experience? So, of course, the world isn't made of smartphones, um, and I think, um, you know, in our industry, maybe we're a little privileged. I've uh, seen a surprising number of iPads here. Um, how many people here have an iPad already? Yeah, so it's a good group of you. So I believe I heard that it, the iPad hasn't even been released in South Africa yet. No? So that's pretty good. Uh, with that said, um, the, I got the iPad, yeah, like two months before it came out in Canada. So. Uh, so how can we streamline the process uh, for those devices? So I feel like I'm kind of pimping Canadian companies today. Um, Mo Mobify Me is, uh, again, another Vancouver-based company. Um, and they, they do um, a pretty cool thing in that they take, uh, allow you to take your existing website and target it 
for mobile devices. And you know, in the, the little picture here, yeah, we see an iPhone up front and center, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, but they do offer the ability to target other devices. So one of the, the key features is the ability to allow for selective content. Um, during the Q&A, uh, one of the things that I was mentioning was that uh, you really want to optimize and only send the information that's important. Uh, so if you've got uh, a website, you can imagine a home page. Um, you know, big company, everybody wants a spot on the home page, so you've got this huge, massive thing, lots of articles. And you're like, well, okay, we don't need all this for the mobile platform. Uh, how can we optimize that experience? And one of that is selective content. Let's only select the amount of content that we need to actually send to the user. Um, in this case, for like my blog, um, well, I've got the title, site title, so people know what site they're on. Navigation, so they can get around. And then the actual blog article. And so what uh, Mobify Me actually allows you to do is select those parts of your page um, and, and then it will only serve up that content. So because of that, you're just sending less information down the pipe. Uh, and then they do a number of other things that I think is really important uh, when creating a mobile experience um, that, uh, again, when it comes down to it, you're really trying to minimize the amount of information that you're sending over the pipe. You want to compress that code, uh, not only at the JavaScript level or the CSS level, uh, but also at the HTML level, you know, remove as much white space as we can. Um, you know, every byte counts, and we really want that fast performance. Um, and another nice little feature is that they will actually also resize um, and host the images for you. Uh, so instead of, let's say, you know, this big background image of 1024 by 768, that you can resize that down so that you're only looking at maybe 300K, uh, or not 300K, 300 pixels wide. Um, and that we can really optimize that experience. And so this is um, the basic interface. Unfortunately, it's a little washed out on the, uh, on the big screen. But what we can do is we can actually specify custom CSS um, on the left-hand side, specific to our mobile experience. So this is the CSS that they're gonna get. So any of the stuff for like navigation or anything else, um, we can remove that stuff and really customize it um, for that device. Um, one of the things, for example, that I, wanted to do on my site was have custom fonts for the headers. Yeah, it was probably more than I needed to do, um, but I really wanted to see how could I do customized fonts um, using the at font face. And uh, in this case, I didn't need to worry about uh, true type um, because the iPhone didn't support it. Um, I didn't need to worry about uh, any of the other font formats the only one that is supported, um, and I, unfortunately the iPhone is the only one that does support it, um, is using SVG fonts, uh, which is really cool. So I was able to specify just the SVG font to be loaded um, and used on my site. Um, unfortunately, the little preview uh, doesn't show my little custom font, uh, but it's there. Um, and so what we see on the, the right-hand side is um, a demonstration of what it's like to look when I actually see this on my phone. And uh, what's hard to see is, is that there's actually a number of links uh, above that. You can kind of see iPhone on the screen there, uh, but it also says Nokia, uh, Razer, Blackberry, um, and there's a bunch of other ones that we can test and we can actually see what it's likely to look like on those devices. Um, so the fact that they automate that experience um, is really handy. So in the case of my website, this is what you would normally see. Um, the fact is, is that I can customize that experience um, using Mobify Me directly for uh, mobile devices. This is uh, in Opera, which also has support for SVG fonts, which is really cool. Um, but there's uh, a bunch of things that I think we can uh, learn from the, the, some of the approaches that um, Mobify Me has implemented um, and, and really should be applied to any mobile site that, that we're doing. So as I was mentioning earlier, you know, we're really trying to optimize the, uh, the task for the user. Uh, you know, what is it that they really want to get access to? Um, you know, we see a lot of websites with these massive headers and uh, large graphics and lots of effects. And you know, for the mobile experience, we just want to see the content. We want to see headlines uh, and we want to start reading and be able to, to access that content as soon as possible. Another key thing that we need to be um, cognizant of is content linearization. Um, I think for anybody that's uh, kind of gotten into the semantic web and understands, um, probably understands a lot of this um, process already, um, 
because it's also been very applicable to the accessibility crowd where we want people to be able to access that content in a very um, linear way that we know that we want to start with the site title uh, that we want to uh, start with the headings that we want to start with the content um, and then we can start looking at you know related links and things like that afterwards you know when we have a large browser you know we can have sidebars upon sidebars and we can place this a lot of content in and around our actual main content and when we start looking at accessibility, when we start looking at mobile platforms, we have to streamline that. And content linearization is um, the best way to do that. So one of the other things uh, from the, the Mobify Me is how do we target uh, mobile devices? Um, and they actually use it uh, essentially through uh, user agent sniffing uh, on the server. So what this bit of code does for the most part the biggest block is that huge string in the middle. And it basically says, okay, well, does the user agent have, well, let's say Alcatel or uh, HTC, um, iPack, iPhone, um, any of those devices um, that we wanna see, um, we wanna have this here. For my particular site, um, I didn't wanna target um, the iPad. I figured the iPad has a pretty big screen. Um, I'll, I'll just show my regular site. I don't have to worry about um, optimizing the experience as much for that device. Um, so the line right before that singles out the iPad to say, no, I don't care about the iPad, move on. And the reason I've done that is because the user agent string um, has iPhone in it, um, even for the iPad. It still says iPhone in the string. So if I didn't put and single out the iPad specifically, um, this content uh, would actually end up still um, getting sent to, to that device. Yes? Does that restrict people from then ever getting to your normal site on a, on a device? So I didn't want to include that code here because I thought it might be a little confusing. Um, the question is, is, how do you want to handle that? Um, and there are a couple ways to do that. Um, the way Mobify Me does it is actually with a cookie. So once it has discovered this, um, it will set a cookie on your device saying mobile equals one. Uh, and then when it comes back, it will actually skip this step and just say, is the cookie here? Okay, show the mobile site. If you click the link to say, no, I want to see the full experience for this device, it sets another cookie that say, no, turn off the, mo the Mobify experience. Um, and so even if you never use the service, you can do exactly the same thing uh, with your code. You just set a cookie saying whether it's on or off. Um, if it's non-existent, it'll always show the uh, the mobile experience. Uh, if it's on, show the mobile experience, and it's only if it's been explicitly set to turn off do you actually send them back to the regular site. So, yes? Sorry, one of the, the other problems or challenges with this um, user agent sniffing is that some of the operators might just strip that out or use a proxy, so it'll come through as some proxy user agent string, and you can't access them by like an X HTTP user agent, for example, but you're a little bit at the mercy of, of the operator that the person surfing to a site. Yeah, and there's, uh, like I know Opera has a specific version uh, of their browser that actually uses a server to fetch all the content, and they basically send you an image of the web page. Um, and they do that for performance. Um, so if all you have is one image that you have to send over, plus a little bit of information like where you can actually press on the thing, can't run JavaScript, can't run video, but at least we have, you know, if you just need to get the content so you, that you can quickly read it, um, that's really easy to do, um, and that was one of the ways that Opera has really tried to optimize the performance. Uh, you know, minimize the amount of information that you're sending over the pipe. Uh, but unfortunately, because it's a server requesting the information, uh, you're at the mercy of whatever um, user agent string that they're sending. Um, no, uh, no amount of sniffing is going to be 100% perfect. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's just the the way that the marketplace is. But at least uh, in this case, uh, we can do a pretty good job of targeting that. So, fairly short session. Um.